Well, let's get going. Well, th thanks again, everybody, for joining in. Um, in today's webinar Wednesday, we'll be uh, tackling tolerances in manufacturing. And I always like to bring in my, my personal experience um, to kind of talk about and introduce different technical topics. And so the way that I, I like to usually do that is always to... Uh, to broach a challenge or challenges in this case that people ask me to, to look at or uh, what ways to do things better. And so today we're going to be looking at four key challenges. Uh, one that I always get when, when, especially when somebody's new to SolidWorks or, or just new to engineering and design, they say, Roland, you know, how do I make sure that my, my fitment and my clearance between the mating parts is good? Not just when I model it, because when I model it, it's perfect. But when I actually physically produce that and, and add GD and T information, for example, tolerancing information, how do I know that the tolerances that I'm using are actually going to give me parts that get put together that are, are sufficient? And so uh, we're going to look at, at tackling that today. Second thing is, is say, you know, when it comes to the tolerancing and, and producing good parts, you know, I'm, I'm running low production volume. You know, what are the options or how can I address that in my design when I have to prototype things versus maybe going on a full production? How do we, you know, evaluate and, and what can we do for low production volume components and sub assemblies within our design team? Uh, the next thing that we're going to look at is we're going to look at tolerancing for design for manufacturing, right? So how can we leverage our CAD um, to, to alter our design? And then ultimately, a big part of using GD&T information is communicating that to the manufacturing team, the people that are either inspecting the parts or maybe machining it or laying out um, the tool paths. OK, so those are the challenges we're going to look at today. And, and in order to solve these challenges and, and look at this, we're going to cover four essentially tools. We're going to look at what we call the tolerance analyst tool, which is a way that we can analyze our tolerance stack up. We're going to look at SolidWorks and, and Mark Forge and talk about how tolerancing information plays into low production volumes with regards to 3D printing. We're going to look at how we could convey our, our data out, leveraging a tool called model-based definition, right? So giving the, the users a, a better format to digest the gd &T information. And then finally, with regards to, hey, we put all this gd &T information on, on the components, you know, we make a component. Well, how do we inspect it? You know, how can we create those inspection reports for our QC team to leverage that more efficiently? So that's what we're going to be um, tackling today. And to do that, I'm going to start off with a SOLIDWORKS assembly. And so what we have here is we have my little uh, prototype shear blade assembly. And I'm going to actually dig into this a little bit more so we can kind of talk about what's going on here. In this case, this uh, a portion of the subassembly is going to have motion, right? And so as this shaft rotates around, it's going to in turn engage with this cam. And what this cam is going to be doing is it's going to be uh, cycling these blades, essentially the upper blade, up and down, and that blade then is going to shear out this material. Now, where gd &T really comes in play here is I'm going to have all these parts produced by some vendors, and when I get these parts back, I need to make sure that they're within a certain tolerance. And the reason this is so important is if these parts are out of tolerance, I, I might still be able to put them together, but this gap between these two blades if it becomes too large or too small, it's going to cause a big problem in my assembly. For example, if that gap is too large, it's going to cause the material to be rolling um, when it gets cut. If the gap is too small, it could cause those blades to essentially crash into each other. And so what I want to do is I want to evaluate and I want to apply this GD information, GDT information into my subassembly. And so that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to go ahead and open up the subassembly. So the first thing that I always get is people say, well, how do I know where to put tolerances? So in this case, we're going to focus on first this, this bottom blade. And what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be building in my tolerancing information into the model and then using SolidWorks to evaluate my tolerance information for what we call tolerance stack up. And the way that I do that is I'm going to leverage a tool called the dim expert command. Now, before I do that, 
one thing that, that this is kind of predicated on is in here in the options within my CAD software, in this case, SolidWorks, I actually have some standards that are built into the machine, into the system. And one of those standards is a very common GDNT standard called the AMSC Y14.5 standard. And what this is defining is defining essentially a way or, or nomenclature of the way I can define all of my tolerancing and GNT placement, things like surface callouts and concentricity and perpendicularity. It's defining how to, to actually put that on the model and also what values to start with. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run my analysis and see if I need to tighten up or open up tolerancing and then in turn see how that's gonna how that's gonna affect my stack up. Now, the way that we get this started is like I said, we use this tool called the auto dimension scheme and we're gonna give it important information. So if we think about this, right, this is the holder for the bottom blade. What we need to tell it is, what the primary, secondary, and tertiary datums are. And if we use a little bit of logic, right, a little bit of engineering logic here, the primary datum is gonna be a, a hard point of reference that's important, is gonna be where this blade mounts to. So in this case, the blade is gonna be um, mounted with some hardware to this face, right? So the back of the bit blade is flush to the front of the blade holder. The secondary datum, and again, the datum is a, is a hard port of reference, this is an important piece, is going to be the top of the blade engaging with the bottom edge of the blade mount. And then the third datum, in this case, is going to be orienting, right, from left to right, the blade alignment. And so in this case, we'll say that third datum is going to be the side of the blade holder. And then what I'm going to tell it is I want it to auto dimension and auto GDNT the entire the model. So I'm going to use this option called all features, and then I'm going to hit OK. And what it does, SolidWorks is actually going to go in there following that ASME standard, and it's going to start placing all my tolerancing information for me using those datums as the important callouts, right, or ways to define where those tolerancing and GDNT information is coming from. Now, if we look at this, we can see that it automatically assigned a tolerancing to the overall. If I dig down in here, it automatically grabbed the call out information with placement uh, information tied to it. It defined the, the whole call outs with the appropriate tolerance for the actual uh, holes where the pins and the bushings are going to line up. And then it color codes that green, letting me know that I've given it all of the GDNT information. Now, at any point, I could double click on any one of these parameters and I could come in here and, and adjust it. But what we're going to do is I'm going to use this as a, essentially a first line pass. And we're going to now come back over here to my sub assembly. And we want to analyze how that tolerance stack up is going to play in with the other components. So, again, for the sake of time prior to this, I've already used my DIM expert tool to apply all my tolerance information to all the sub pieces, which now lets me go ahead and start building my actual what we call tolerance analyst study or what they call for short toll analyst. And so we'll find that in this same wizard, what we call the DIM expert manager. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and fire off a study so it can evaluate the tolerancing information that I've already defined. In this case, the first thing we need to do is give it a goal. And so the goal or the thing that we wanna kind of keep an eye on is essentially the gap between the two blades. The reason is, is when I run this study, I want to make sure that in this case, this gap isn't getting too large or getting too small. If my tolerance, right, if the physical parts when they get manufactured, if they're all on the high side, it can affect that gap. If the components are all on the low side of the tolerance information, it can affect that gap. And so what we want to see is we want it to actually run the statistical analysis and, and run all those iterations of the true tolerance to make sure that this gap is going to stay within a certain deviation. Now, once I have that, like most tools inside SOLIDWORKS, it's going to ask me to run through the setup. And in this case, the next thing that we need to do is we need to start defining essentially the, what we call the assembly sequence. And I like to think of this as the order of importance or the way that the tolerances are going to engage with each other. And so what we do is we literally graphically select the components from the screen. In this case, the lower blade is the first thing that's most important to me. 
the tolerancing of the lower blade is going to affect the thing that it is attached to, in this case, the knife block. The knife block, in turn, is connected to these guide pins, which are sitting inside these bushings. And then these bushings are flushed up and concentric to the upper knife block. And then finally, that upper knife block is engaged with the upper blade. And so this order of uh, assembly sequence is telling the system how to evaluate the tolerancing. What we're going to do next is we're going to give it what we call assembly constraints. Okay? And you can think of these as mates. This is going to help the system learn what tolerancing needs to take precedent or to be first over what needs to take happen second. So let's let's look at this logically here. So if we start with our lower blade, right? This lower blade is essentially has two connection points to the part that it's connected to. It's connected flush to the back of the blade, and then it's connected flush to the bottom of the blade. Now, which one of those is more important and is going to have a more effect on essentially the gap? Well, in our case, the thing that's going to affect that gap is the tolerancing of how the back of the blade is touching the blade holder. So I'm going to set that to one by clicking on one. And then the other constraint, I'm going to set to two. And then we're going to work our way through each one of these components and telling it which tolerance essentially is most important. And it's going to start building those statistical studies in the background. Now, a lot of these are pretty simple. For example, these guide pins and these bushings, they're literally only concentric in the way they're constrained. So defining those be becomes a lot simpler because there's only really one option of the way that thing can sit in there. And that is essentially concentric. Those ones become simple. When we get to the, the upper blade is where it gets a little bit more complicated. And we'll talk about that here in a second. Okay, so now I'm back to the upper blade. So the same thing on the upper blade, very similar to the bottom blade. If I look at this, we can see there's two kind of real hard points of reference, and that's those datums that I was defining. And now which one of those datums is going to be more important to me? In this case, the one that is mounting that blade front to back is going to have a bigger deviation on that gap. So I'm going to set that a priority to one, and then I'm going to set the top priority blade to two, because whether this is up further in the y direction or down further in the y direction really isn't going to affect that gap laterally from left to right. Now, once I have all of my assembly constraints uh, defined, I'm going to go ahead and tell the study to run the study. And when it does, you're going to start seeing some really valuable information. In this case, the first thing that you're going to notice is that SOLIDWORKS is giving me the min and the max deviation. So what that means here is if all my tolerancing is on the load side, that gap, the minimum, is going to be uh, 188 thousandths, negative. So not good in this case. The max is going to be 419 thousandths, so fairly large gap. I can export these results and maybe go and start evaluating the models or the way that I have things assembled. But what I like to do is I actually like to look at down here what has the biggest impact on that. And so if we look at this one called simple hole, this is the hole essentially for the mounting of these two pins. And we can see that is contributing about to 80% of that deviation value. Now I can tighten that up, right, by double clicking on any one of these and changing that tolerance. So maybe I'm going to just cut that tolerance in half to 0.1 millimeter. And when I do that, I can now see my min and my max automatically update. So what that tolerance analyst tool is giving you is giving you the ability to actually evaluate the tolerancing information that you're putting on the model. And it could be as simple as, as using a blanket statement. You could say a lot of times I'll see people start off saying, hey, if everything is two decimals, use a, a, a plus or minus tolerance of 30 thousandths. If it's three decimals, use a plus or minus of 15 thousandths. And maybe that is sufficient. But how do we truly know? And that's where the tolerance analyst tool comes into play. It gives you the ability to truly evaluate that RSS stack up of all your deviations. Now, if we come back over here to our sub assembly, the next thing we want to look at is we want to look at this linear actuator assembly, which is going to be driving the feed table, essentially. 
And there's two components that we're going to really start to evaluate when we when it start when we're referring to tolerancing and manufacturing. And so this first one, I'm going to hide a few things so we can see in here, is this plate. Now, a lot of times customers will come to me and they'll say, hey, Roland, you know, we're doing a low production volume of this and we don't want to invest all of our time in actually creating the CNC toolpath and all of the information uh, for full production. Or maybe we're, we're going to essentially have this thing cast and we're not ready to invest in the casting tooling yet. So we need to create a uh, essentially a small production run. So how can we do that? Well, in this case, you know, Marcus and I put our heads together and we said, you know what, we could leverage an FDM style printer that we have access. Right. So one of the solutions that MLC has is our line of 3D printers. And in this case, we represent one of the lines we represent is called Mark Forge. And so what we're which is an FDM style printer that can, can print in composite plastics. So in this case. We leveraged our Mark IV printer, Mark Forge printer, and we printed a high quality, high strength, um, essentially almost like equal to an aluminum machine part uh, at a low volume. Now, how does that affect my tolerancing in the model? Well, let's go take a look at this model. So right now, if we if I turn this around, some of the mating features, right, the ways that we're physically putting this together is by leveraging some threaded hardware. And so in this case, you'll notice that I have some tapped holes. Now that Mark Forge printer, depending on the print and depending on the geometry and the material you're using, in that case we were using a material called Onyx, it will give you different variances on the tolerancing of the manufacturing process. In this case, the tolerancing of that manufacturing process was just a little too loose to actually 3D print the threads. And so Marcus and I put our heads together and say, how, how can we modify this design, but still keep the essence of what we need to physically manufacture? And so what we did, all right, is we leveraged a design table within SolidWorks to create configurations. And so in this case, to allocate for the different types of manufacturing tolerancing that I'm going to be dealing with, I actually have four variations or four configurations of this model that are going to mechanically essentially do the exact same thing. And one of those is called 3D printed, which kind of gets into what we call design for manufacturing. Right. What does that mean? In this case, I know that my tolerancing of the 3D print is a little too loose to print an actual thread. And so what we did is we turned off or we suppressed those threads and we altered the design for the tolerancing of our manufacturing process. And in this case, what we did is we came in here and I'm going to section this out so you can kind of see the inside of it. And we said anywhere there was a threaded feature, turn off that threaded feature so we don't actually print the thread and we modeled up an actual void in the material. In this case, that void is a shell, or you could think of it as a pocket for an eight millimeter hex nut. And so leveraging the, the vast capability of our Mark Forge printer, what happens is, is when we put this into the slicer and it starts slicing this up on a bunch of layers to prepare it for the 3D print, it actually put in a pause routine for us. So in that pause routine, it stopped, at which point we could then insert that hex nut and then tell the printer to keep on printing and it would print material around that hex nut embedding that hardware into the component. So now we achieve our overall desired component without actually having to truly change the overall design. And again, we can manage that very effectively as we go through the, the design process, leveraging our design table. And this design table is turning off certain features and turning on certain features to allocate for that variance in the actual tolerancing of that manufacturing process. If we come over here, we can see we have a machined one. So this part in, in a high production volume, we're going to cast it and then we're going to just machine out pieces of it. Prior to that casting, once we vetted out our design with our 3D print, we, we actually machined a fully functional machine part, which then took us to our raw final component that had all of the machine features in it. So again, in conjunction with our model, we're now leveraging that design table to get the variances or the, the variations, I should say, 
and what we call a configuration to allocate for those different tolerancing capabilities within the manufacturing process. Now, when we start talking about tolerancing, one of the biggest things that I always run into, me personally and also customers, is conveying that information to the downstream feature, uh, downstream team members. And so in this case, let's look at another example in this assembly. In this case, I'm going to look at this thing called this actuator flange. Now, what's important about this actuator flange is we're going to have this outsourced and we're going to have one of our vendors machine us this component. And those guys, they're not really engineers, you know, they're more cam guys, and they sometimes struggle, you know, interpreting an old school 2D blueprint. So they always ask us, they say, hey, can you just send us the model and, you know, maybe put the information directly on the model so we could spin it around and, and really understand what we're looking at? And we say, sure. And the way that we, we do that, the way that we can create that while still creating all of the information or what we call PMI information is by leveraging a tool called model-based definition. It stands for, or we call it MBD, which stands for model-based definition. Now, how do we put that information on here? And then how do we actually output that into our, our final customer, in this case, our vendor? Well, I'm gonna come back over here to my DIM Expert tool. DIM Expert really makes it easy because we're gonna be following a known industry standard, the ASME standard, to apply that information. So again, leveraging that same auto dimension scheme, I'm going to start giving it important information. Now, the machine shop doesn't need precise tolerance on every single feature that they're machining. They really need it off of some key main things, which in this case are going to be how this thing is mounted is really what's most important. So I'm going to define that by, again, using my datums, my primary datum. I know that this actuator flange is going to sit flush to its mating component and then it's going to be concentrically aligned to a bearing that is um, beneath it. Now I don't need to give it GD&T information across everything so instead of saying all features this time I'm going to just choose the key features. In this case this would be for example like the bolt hole pattern. This is going to be sitting on a collar. It's going to be flush to the collar so that's important that that base right here is defined correctly. And then on the opposite side, it's going to be concentrically mated to that uh, Acme gear. Once I have that, I would go ahead and hit this green check mark and it's going to auto generate my tolerance information. Now at this point, this is usually where people create a traditional 2D blueprint. And that's not that there's anything wrong with the 2D blueprint. I, I still create them myself too, but that's kind of the crutch of the of the situation in this case is that our vendor, our machine shop, really just, just they just struggle with interpreting 2D blueprints. So how can we give them a better deliverable that is a little bit more interactive and kind of stays in that 3D space? And again, the way that we do that is we leverage this tool called MBD. Now, what MBD is, is you can think of it as taking like fancy little 3D pictures that have the PMI information actually on it. And I'll show you what that deliverable looks like in a second. In this case, if I look at the front of the part, imag imagine that like as a drawing view in a drawing, I'm going to tell MBD to go ahead and capture that as what we call a 3D view. And I'm going to give that view a name. I'm going to call this a front view collar. And then we'll hit the grin check mark. And what it does is it starts building this little view palette down here. Now I can use this in, in conjunction with other features in the 3D world. So for example, maybe I want them to see that pocket a little bit clearer. So I'm gonna create me a, a little section view. I'm gonna go to the right profile view and then I'm gonna move this stuff around so they can kind of see it a little bit better. If I wanted to, I could hit the tilde sign on my keyboard and I could change the orientation. In this case, I kind of like the way everything looks. And so I'm going to go ahead and tell MBD to capture that as a view. So in this case, I'm going to call this right section view. And then finally, maybe I want to give them a view of essentially everything, right? Isometric view, all the GD information that they could ever want or need. And I'm going to capture that as a view. I'm going to call this ISO main. 
Now, our vendor doesn't have SOLIDWORKS. And if they did, I could just send them this and they would have all the information they need to, one, manufacture the part and then also inspect the part before they send it to us. But they're not SOLIDWORKS users. They're not engineers. They're not CAD people, which is fine. So what can I send them other than a 2D blueprint, which is time consuming and also can be hard to interpret? Down here in my MBD interface, you're going to notice that I have the ability to publish this out as a 3D PDF, which is very popular. And the cool thing about that 3D PDF is it lets the, the end user engage with that. They can zoom it in. They can zoom it out. They can navigate through all those views. They can even pull measurements off that 3D PDF, and they still have all of that PMI information that they need. Another way that I could give that to them is with what we call a step 242, which in this case is pretty popular because that step file is now has all of this information embedded on it. So if they're using a tool like Mastercam, they can actually leverage that directly into their CAM solution. In my case, probably my favorite deliverable is publishing this as an e-drawings file. And the reason I like that is because e-drawings is a free viewer. And so what that does is you can almost think of this like as a 2D print, but instead of being in the 2D world, they're now in the 3D world. And all of that information that I captured, my front view, my top view, my left view, gives them the ability to engage this, but it also lets them rotate it around, zoom in, zoom out, measure. If they needed to send something back to me, like they had a question, they could mark it up directly from this interface. And so it gives them a little bit more clear understanding of what we're trying to produce. So in lieu of sending them a traditional 2D blueprint, I'm now sending them an a 3D e-drawings file that has all of that same information on it. And again, from our perspective, you know, working with a lot of different customers, we see, we're see we seeing this become much more common. One, because people don't want to have to manage a 2D piece of paper anymore. And two, a lot of times people just don't know what they're looking at when you're looking at a traditional 2D blueprint. So this gives them a little bit clearer understanding of what we're trying to convey. Now, I'm not against 2D drawings, you know, and I still do them from time to time and, and that's fine. So that leads me into our next topic, which is our quality team, right? We don't want to leave those guys behind. So when we're talking about tolerancing information, right, we, we've looked at how tolerancing affects stack up, right? That's physically manufacturing the part. We've looked a little bit at what we call DFM, which is designed for manufacturing. You know, how can we use our CAD tool to alter the design without changing it? In that case, we were looking at design tables and configurations in conjunction with 3D printing. We've then looked at how we can convey that information to an end user, uh, not using a complicated 2D blueprint. So we used MBD and we actually gave them a 3D output. Now, the last thing that we're going to look at here is we want to look at our quality or our QC inspection reports. So in my previous life, I used to run a sheet metal manufacturing facility. And in there, right, we made a lot of parts for a lot of different customers. And before we shipped the part, we had to have a QC inspector create an inspection report. And so a lot of times what that report looks like is something like this, right? Where they come in here, they take a drawing and they take that drawing and they create what we call the balloon print where Believe it or not, more times than not, people would do this manually. They would literally print this out and put little numbers on every me measurable characteristic. That would be like every dimension or every note that needed to be confirmed. And then in turn, what they would do is they would go into Excel. And if they were savvy with Excel, they might create this Excel report that matched up to that balloon drawing. And then as they measured it, they would fill out this Excel report. And then this was the deliverable that we would print out and send with the parts that we were shipping. Now, the problem with that is, is a couple things. One, it's very labor intensive. It requires somebody to go in there, interpret the drawing, look at the dimension, look at the tolerance, and be able to do that simple math, or in the case of like a, a location, understand what that is, and then generate this report. And if an ECR happened, guess what? They had to start all the way from scratch. They would have to rebuild the report totally from scratch. So how can we automate that? So I'm going to show you two tools, right, or, or two ways that you can automate it. The tool that I'm going to be using is a tool called SOLIDWORKS Inspection. So if you are a SOLIDWORKS user and, you, and you're producing parts that then need to be inspected by a QC inspector, how can I leverage the work I've already done in my CAD drawing? 
Well, here with, with inspection, I'm going to tell it to start a new inspection project. And what's really neat about this is they have almost all the standards built into them, the ANSI standard, the ISO standard, or you could even customize your own standard. In this case, I'm going to use one of my customized default standards. And what it does is it starts building that report automatically. So that Excel file and that PDF file no longer have to be manually generated. I can now pull this tolerance information directly off the metadata of the actual drawing. Now, in this case, my report, I want to include, say, the part name. So what's cool about this is since it's running inside SOLIDWORKS, I can actually go grab the metadata directly off of the model or off of the drawing. In this case, the part name, I'm going to grab the description for part number. It's giving me access to the information that's embedded in custom properties, part revision, grabbing the revision off the title block. And now I'm not having to literally manually type this in which sounds kind of silly, but you'd be surprised at how much of a bottleneck that is when we get into the manufacturing process and we're waiting now on our QC person to generate this report. Now, the second I have all my, all my parameters, and for the sake of time, I'm just going to say part name, part number, part revision, and maybe I'm going to define the lot size. I'm going to say, hey, this is a lot size of 500. I'm going to go ahead and hit OK. And what that does is it automatically builds that Excel file and it automatically balloons and places these balloons on my drawing on a layer called inspection. And so now all I have to do is export this out by hitting export to 2D PDF or export to Excel. And that would generate essentially those two files that we were just looking at. Now, the benefit to this is if we change something, right? So if we change something to this design, I already have 99% of this report done. All I have to do is go ahead and update my report, right? Update this inspection project. It would grab any new features or features that have been removed and it would, it would automatically generate that report again. Now I do see a question that says, can you do an inspection report for an MBD file? Absolutely, which actually leads me into my next uh, way to use inspection. Now, like I said, in my previous life, I used to run a manufacturing facility and we were contract manufacturers. And so what that meant was, is we had our own internal drawing, but we always had to inspect to the customer drawing. And believe it or not, a lot of the times our customers weren't using SOLIDWORKS. They might be using something else. And so the other way that you can do this, and this is very popular because it doesn't require a seat of SOLIDWORKS, is to run the inspection tool as a standalone product. In this case, my customer or my vendor sent me a PDF. So it's not a SOLIDWORKS drawing. It's not a DXF or DWG. It's just a PDF. It might even have been a scanned PDF. And so what inspection gives you that ability to do is when I start a new project, okay, if I come in here and I start a new project, you'll notice that I can bring in obviously CAD files. I can bring in step files. I can bring DXF, DWGs, uh, the MBD is an actual SOLIDWORKS supported file, so I could bring that file directly into the system. I could bring in TIFF files or even a, uh, a 242 or even some other proprietary things like a CATIA file or a PTC Pro E file. So the benefit of the standalone tool is the fact that you can now generate those inspection reports from any file type. It does not have to be a SOLIDWORKS drawing, including an MBD uh, output. Now, what's cool about this is that what this does, it, what the power of it is it has what they call an OCR, which is object recognition. So instead of the user having to come in here and manually type all this information in, we can let inspection automatically pull that out. Let me show you how it works in kind of two capacities. In this case, I'm going to first start off down here with this title block. So over here, I have the part number. Since this is a PDF file, there's, there's no metadata in it. So I'm going to click that little lightning bolt, and I'm going to drag that lightning bolt around the drawing number. And what you're going to notice is, is that it's going to try and run that object recognition and auto-generate that part number. I could do the same thing for revision. So I can come in here, drag the little lightning bolt around revision, and you're going to notice it's going to go ahead and extract that off the PDF file. Now, for the rest of the information, right? I don't wanna to have to come in here and auto extract out one of these a la carte, meaning one at a time. 
So instead, what I'm going to tell it to do is I'm going to tell inspection to try to first run an auto extraction. So when I click on that button, it's going to ask me, Roland, what do you want me to build the report off of? Dimensions, GDT information, any kind of surface callouts, any datum features that I recognize. And usually what I say is, is first line pass, go ahead and, and try to grab everything. I'm going to hit this green check mark. What happened is, is that OCR tool is going to go in there. It's going to evaluate everything on the screen. And it's actually going to build my characteristic balloons for me. Now let's take one of these as an example. I'm gonna use this characteristic called 18. We can see that it has a, a diameter of 1.457 plus 1,000 minus zero. And so what happens is when I run that auto extract, it comes in here and it actually intelligently, right? The user doesn't need to know anything. It intelligently evaluated that and said, okay, what is the nominal value? The nominal value is 1.457. It has a discrete tolerance of plus one, that one ten thousandth and minus zero. It extracted that tolerance information into my tolerance columns, and then it actually build, built my upper and lower limit. So again, the power of the tool is the fact that the user doesn't have to know exactly what they're looking at. Now, it's beneficial if they, they understand what they're looking at, but this really does automate that process. Now there's a lot of, there's many templates. So if you're looking at this and you say, Roland, I don't like the way those balloons look. Can they be white with red coloring or black? Absolutely. This is just the template that I'm using. Now to bring this full circle, right? The, the QC inspector is then going to actually go and physically measure this, right? Like they're going to literally go out to the shop floor. They're going to grab a micrometer or they're going to grab a caliper or height gauge or something like that. And they're going to start measuring these values. So how can inspection help with automating that process? Well, with inspection, we can link up to any digital measuring device. And so what that means, right, is if you were looking at me right now, is as I measure something with the digital device that's plugged into my machine, it'll cue that measurement up and I can start working my way through the report, building my actual evaluation. Now, what's cool about this is if I put, if I measured a value outside of spec, right? Um, it's gonna highlight that value red. If I measure a value inside of spec, it's gonna highlight that value green. So it's actually not just building the report in Excel, but it also has a little bit of an intelligence into the system so it can start color coding it. So we can start evaluating, hey, what characteristics are not coming within our predefined specification? Now, I was fortunate enough in my previous life to actually have some CMM machines. So our QC inspectors would take the part, they go put it on the CMM machine, and they would let the machine run it. Can inspection help us with that? The answer is absolutely. So over here on the right-hand side of my screen, you'll notice that I have what we call a CMM data import. If you, if you are leveraging something like a CMM machine, once you go measure that with your measuring device, it's going to give you a report. We could then come in here and add that report in and have it auto generate matching up to the report off of the PDF of those actually measured characteristics. Now the end game is, is we, we, we need to essentially print that out at some capacity. So it's the same steps. Once we have our part measured, we have all of our characteristics defined. We can come in here and say, export this to a 2D PDF export the Excel file, and that's how we end up with our final deliverable with a fully measured part that has color-coded characteristics that match up to my balloon drawing. Now, again, that can seem kind of simple, but you'd be surprised of how much that right there is a bottleneck when we get into the manufacturing floor. So it's not always just defining the tolerance, it's conveying the tolerance and then inspecting to that tolerance. So these are all tools that streamline that process. Now, one thing that I love about this, because this would always happen, is we'd be prototyping a part for one of our customers. In the middle of that process, they would send us an updated drawing. So can inspection help us there? And the, app, the answer is absolutely. If I come over here, you'll notice I can hit replace and I can go and grab a new updated drawing and inspection will actually superimpose those two things on top of each other. And what it'll do is it's going to color code new characteristics. Those are characteristics that weren't there on the first revision. It's going to color code with red characteristics that have been removed. 
And then it's going to color code with yellow characteristics that have changed. So maybe they didn't remove a dimension or delete it or add a dimension, but the value of the dimension or tolerance changed. So it automatically updates that and streamlining that process of regenerating our inspection report. For me, I then would put all that in PDM and revision control, and I'm off to the races. Now, each one of these topics I could probably talk on for days, to be honest with you. But in this short webinar Wednesday, you know, I had to work within our time constraints. And so I wanted to give you guys a high level overview of how these tools can help you guys when we're referring to tolerating within our manufacturing. So to kind of recap, and then we'll, we'll break for a little Q&A, is we looked at the tolerance analyst tool to actually do a fast and teller, intelligent tolerancing and evaluation of the tolerance. We looked at how we could leverage our 3D CAD tool in conjunction with rapid prototyping with our Mark Forge printer and create variations. We leveraged our SOLIDWORKS drawing to create our inspection reports. And we used a tool called MBD to then convey that information over to our downstream vendor, our machine shop, essentially. Um, so that way they could actually produce the parts. And I just want to thank everybody for coming in. And if you have any questions or if any one of these topics really kind of tug at one of your heartstrings, let us know. Again, this is a 5,000 foot level flyover in each one of these little topics. But uh, but when we start digging into it, there's obviously a lot more that can go into that. 